So that was, oh, it's on. So that was awesome. Like, I feel like you should run for Congress or something after uh, Tally, uh, you know, becomes a massive company. Um, Talk about anxiety. Just, so w one question, and I was really kind of blown away by this. Um, did your dad graduate law school? He did. And so he's good? He's not. He's not good? Not good. Okay, well, I, it's nonetheless an impressive story about where you came from. I don't think I've ever met anyone who was homeschooled before, but like, you know, if they're all like you, like, that, that's amazing, so. They, they, they've got quirks. <laughs> they've got quirks, okay, fair enough. Any homeschoolers here? Uh, oh, Rex, Rex is a homeschooler. Rex homeschooler. Okay, oh, that Asia's, Asia's homeschooled too. <laughs> wow, we'll have to get a little club together. Uh, so, talk a little bit about the, the, the motivation behind Tally, you made you know, brief reference to it with your, your co-founder and you, but what, what was going on in your life that made you say, okay, I need to do this? Anybody read Sapiens? A couple people. Yeah, Rex too. It's this book by this guy named Yuval Noah Harari, and it's like this 30,000 foot view of where, what, what makes these animals, sapiens, so different from the others. And it's like this like big arc and it kind of gets to the end, and then it starts turning into a dash line. And I just became convinced that when we look back on, on the, the next 20 years, the key theme will be how automation influences the human experience. And there's going to be really interesting chapters. There's going to be a chapter on all the truckers who are going to lose their job over a span of like four years. What does society do? How do we support them? How do we, you know, retool, whatever? But there's also going to be a chapter on how people used to have all this stress and all of this um, distraction in their life, and that that was fundamentally taken away from them. And for me, I, I, just, I believe that when the sand runs out of my hourglass, that's the end. And the idea that you could be living a life that has medical-grade anxiety all the time is just untenable to me. And the idea that we can build technology that can make that be a lot less or go away is really motivating. So it was just this desire to actually like play a role in, in where, where humans are headed and feeling like this is, this is a place that I can contribute. So did you have a lot of personal debt as well and credit card debt? Uh, so I, I had a very different um, um, experience than my parents. I started my first company in college and had 400 employees by the time I graduated college. So it was a very, very different experience. Um, I did have credit card debt. Um, Actually, when I uh, earlier, but that was uh, that was taken care of because I ended up building a reasonably successful company. Gotcha, gotcha. And um, in terms of what you're doing now, you, you you mentioned one of the slides that really struck me was your view that the banks are going to catch up in many areas, right? And they are deathly afraid of you know being rendered utilities, and so they are going to fight tooth and nail so that doesn't happen. Um, you would agree that the credit card business is a really, really good business for the banks, right? It is the most profitable bank lending business you can be in, yes. Okay, so the most profitable, more the than most profitable. mortgages, auto loans, yes. the whole bit. Yep. Um, and so therefore, it, it follows that um, they're not going to be happy with a tally as it continues to scale, right? Because you are essentially um, providing a service where the banks will make less money, extract less rents um, that they are currently doing now, right? That would be correct. So that's a big deal, like from the standpoint of who you're choosing to kind of take on. You're taking on banks, not just banks, but banks with the most profitable activity that they have. Um, any thoughts on um, their ability to use, you know, shock and awe rewards or other solutions to try and avert more people from ultimately choosing a tally? Yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing is, is actually the rewards programs created credit card debt. So what's interesting about credit cards is it's a bundled product. So it is a payment product. So it has all these awesome attributes besides rewards. I mean, it's uh, less liability than if you paid with your debit card, free float, like all these things. But then bundled with it is this, this loan. And um, consumers, systematically discount the likelihood that they'll be using that loan, even if they have credit card debt. Kind of like there's a lot of people who have bought uh, uh, exercise equipment and they're completely in denial that it's not gonna sit in the garage and collect dust. And it inevitably sits in the garage and collects dust. Like, 
Hairless apes are just really bad at multi-period optimizations, and workout equipment is one area where we just don't shine, and credit cards are the other. And so it's actually the rewards program that creates credit card debt in the first place. Because in a world where uh, rewards were illegal, then people would just choose the best loan product, and they would optimize on a single, single, single thing, which would be rate. So when we were thinking about Tally in the early days, our biggest fear was that they would be able to shut this down. And we were able to engineer in a way where we don't think that's possible. Now, the, the, big, the big unknown is if they actually used the law to make these things kind of illegal. So if the lobbies were strong enough to actually get legislation in place where technologies that effectively unbundle the credit card are somehow not allowed, then obviously that'd be very bad. But people dig their rewards programs. I mean, putting aside the law, yeah, yeah. people really like their rewards programs, right? right? And we, we enhance the rewards program. So now we basically let the customer get all the rewards and the benefits, and they don't have to worry about the bad stuff, which are all the fees and all the interest. So from, from a rewards perspective, we are letting the customer get all those, and the bank has to pay for that. Um, but then we sweep all of these balances that are getting charged way too high interest, uh, and we're then charging them uh, a fair interest that's based on the credit. So we're taking away the profitability of the lending side of that business. And you mentioned that um, only 16% of all Americans have uh, an auto pay feature, um, you know, triggered on their, their credit cards. Um, do you exist in part because of that statistic, meaning you know, banks are just simply not incentivized to have their their credit card borrowers to ultimately, you know, put their their bills on auto pay? Yeah, so this is an interesting story. Uh, how many people here have a store card, like a Kohl's or a Gap or, okay, a few? Uh, how many people here, like, the Gap one is a great one. Like, has anybody seen the UI for the Gap, like, card? It, it's, it's one of the worst. And so we thought, hey, do you know what? Tally should partner with retailers. Okay. We should partner with retailers and you should distribute Tally to your customers because we give them a better experience. So we met with Kohl's. I don't have an NDA, so I'm just going to throw them under the bus. Uh, we met with Kohl's and uh, very senior. And the, the quote I love was, I can see how this is great for the customers, but we really like late fees. So why would we ever partner with you? Late fees. Yeah. And so, so things like the Gap card, you can't even do auto pay. So this is by design. So, so the, the retail card industry is the absolute worst. So, so Gap or Kohl's, we're talking about half a billion dollars of guaranteed money every single year. It's a lot easier than selling shirts. So the retailers love their business and they try to make it as horrible as possible. Now, the bigger regulated banks, uh, the regulators are on them a lot more so they have a much better, better interface. But yeah, it's, um, we exist because the banking industry makes it difficult on people. And that's not inclusion. So, I mean, like we exist, all of us exist because of the banking industry, the way it's structured. Right. <clears throat> um, so, okay, let's talk about, more, you know, the fact that you uh, called Tally the first robo debt advisor, right? Obviously, credit card debt is huge, but, you know, everybody has seen the statistics. Student loan debt is $1.5 trillion. I'm sure it's gonna go to two in, in due course. Um, Auto loans are, are a big factor. You're, you're just doing credit card debt today, but I would imagine to fulfill your aspiration, you have to go into other big debt categories too, right? Yeah, not just debt categories. I mean, again, I think everybody on that automation slide, maybe not everybody, but most, we're all trying to go to the same place, which is this fully automated experience where the service is mediating every aspect of your financial life for you. So debt would be one side of it, but um, your savings, your insurance, all those things, and that it's, it's turning those things from products, like let's take like an insurance policy from a product, to like a service where, you know, Maybe you're a primary insurer, maybe you're, you're moving that insurance from pr carrier to carrier throughout the year, whatever would, would optimize the customer's benefit. So I think the, the, the place where we are racing as fast as we can to is full automation of your entire financial life. We have, I think, a higher bar than some of the folks. Is We just think that if you require people to do work, it just it falls apart. And even like filling out PDFs or, or signing or like, like you have to remove 
almost all friction that is humanly possible, and it means you just have this massive engineering bill because to get that last 20% is really, really expensive, and it's fine to make recommendations. That's pretty easy, but getting to full automation is difficult, so we are, uh, we're, I guess you could say we're slogging away at it like the hard way because we have such a high standard for what automation means. But you, 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 in terms of your business model, though, you don't charge for the, the automation. You no. charge on the financing, right? Yep. So in theory, um, there might be other verticals that you could also be a financing partner to your customer. Through. Right, or, or other non-lending products. Yeah, our, our view is we should only make money when we're creating economic value for the customer. So the only time we ever charge interest is if we're A, protecting you from, from fees, or B, if we are charging you a lower interest rate than what's on your card. So the customer would be paying interest one way or another, but now they're paying a lot less because they're paying it to tally. So we can only make money when we're saving so the money. Let's give a real world example yeah. of that. I have 10,000 of credit card debt, and um, I decide to sign up for tally and I'm paying 20% APR on yep. that debt with my credit card. Yep. You then take that over, you pay off the credit card. Yep. My account stays open, I can yep. continue to get my rewards. Yep. And let's say I have a, a very high FICO score, you're charging me some amount below that 20%. Yeah, so maybe you're paying like 8.9 or 9.9, .9, something like that. And we are now managing the $10,000 of debt. Let's say you spend $2,000 every month, we would then take your, your spending and you would try to set a goal for, let's say, to be out of debt in like two years. And then we would come up with a recommended payment that covers your new spending plus your existing so that we can make sure that you have a zero total debt balance in two years. If, right. that, if that was realistic for your income. Yeah. Right. And you don't provide today anyway, you don't provide guidance you know, for, for the many people out there who have six, seven, eight credit cards and they're trying to optimize where they're going to get the most reward points you don't yet tell them where they should spend their money, right, to maximize those reward points, right? Yeah, that's one of my favorite features, but it turns out there's only like 10% of nerds who really care about that. So my co-founder is our head of product. He told me I'm gonna have to wait for that one for a little while. But I've, really? got, I've got like 10 or 11 credit cards I love. I feel points. like everybody is hooked on their reward. I mean, well, I guess not. We live in a bubble. Yeah, most people are like, shit, I've got two kids and my life is really busy and optimizing points and getting an extra $100 a year is not. Okay, so let's talk about anxiety, right? Yeah. Because um, somebody showed the stat earlier today, many people have seen it. 80% um, of people out there live paycheck to paycheck and in a crisis, a, a very high percentage of, of people couldn't come up with $400. And you've talked about anxiety even amongst people who have high FICO scores. So my takeaway from that is everybody in this country pretty much is really worried about money and servicing their debt, right? 100%. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, again, going back to, to the sapiens, like money is just a, uh, it's a representation of survival right? It's, it's a coconut or it's shelter. And anything that has to do with like, am I going to be able to feed and protect myself and my family is it's very core to survival. And it happens to be that money is the accounting system by which we keep track of, uh, you know, how much shelter and transportation and food we have access to. So that's why it's so, so anxiety ridden because it's literally about survival. So if, if, if your customers are going to transfer that concern over to you to manage. That puts a lot of pressure on you to make sure that your systems are very secure, that you have backup facilities in place, that everything that you do um, is done such that you never break that bond of trust, right? Because if you were to lose that trust, yeah. that's a real problem for your business. Right? Yeah, internally we use the term faith, right? Because trust is, hey, I understand what you said you're gonna do and then you're gonna do it, whereas faith is more like, wow, like, you say you're going to do this like broad thing, but I don't know how you're going to do it. So it is a very, uh, very high level of faith that people put in us. And I mean, again, that's why we spent the extra two years building the technology because making it work in all these edge cases uh, and having redundancy built in, it's just that last 20% is really expensive to build. So uh, we were fortunate to have investors who supported our longer term view because had we not been able to raise that money, we wouldn't have had the luxury of building that. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so last question here. Um, I want to talk about inclusion uh, and specifically, um, as many people may have seen, FICO announced that they're going to pilot a program next year called FICO Ultra, I believe. Um, it was billed as a way to sort of broaden out the considerations that are used in determining a borrower's creditworthiness. Um, 
maybe it will help people, hopefully it will help people with a thin credit file. What's your take on that? Does that affect your business? And how will that or not impact inclusion moving forward in your view? Yeah, so for, for those people who don't know, there's lots of FICOs. There's FICO 8, there's FICO 9. Uh, there's also Vantage, which is a competing uh, score. And all, of, all, all these credit scores, they're just regression models that are on top of the actual data of, of, your, of your file, so all your payments. And it, it ultimately just comes out with a number. And what's interesting about FICO or Vantage is it does a very good job of rank ordering the likelihood of default. So a 700 FICO is much less likely to default in a two-year period than a 650, even through a crisis. Now, the, the rate of defaults will go up and down depending on the economic environment, but the ordering us usually stays, stays constant, and that held through the financial crisis. What's interesting about Ultra FICO is um, it's taking FICO and then saying, hey, there's let's say a million people with 600 FICOs, there's got to be some gradation of, of riskiness within that, that group of a million people with 600s. And Ultra FICO is taking in data from your checking account to look at what's going on to try to tell the difference between this 600 and that 600. So ultimately, if it actually works, which that let's just say like will rank ordering work with Ultra FICO. If it does work, it's going to mean that some people will not get credit that would otherwise had credit at a given price and other people will get credit that they wouldn't have gotten at a, a different price. So it just allows lenders to better price risk because they can tell the difference between this 600 FICO and that 600 FICO. I, what does your gut tell you, though, in terms of the net beneficiaries versus people who... It's going to reward people who have good habits on their checking account. So I do, I do think it will allow somebody to stand out who otherwise has no, no way to prove to the lender that, hey, I'm better than the other 600. It's like, look, I don't get over, overdrafts, I have a job, those kind of things. So I do think it will, will help more responsible people get cheaper access to credit. Are they the greatest beneficiaries or is it the traditional credit providers that maybe don't use alt data like you do probably when you're making your decision? Yeah, so, so I mean like a tally wouldn't benefit much from it because we already have your bank account information, so we already have the signals, but for, for less uh, tech savvy uh, financial institutions, it'll definitely help them. Great, um, okay, do we have time for questions? Okay. Two questions. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. can. So obviously one of your value proposition is that, right, that you make the loans at a lower fees for the credit card and help them pay it off. Do you think the banks will catch on to that strategy and lower their, what they charge on the uh, balance? That was one of the first questions we got asked at our seed round. And I forget the math now, but there's, call it a trillion dollars of credit card debt that's getting charged these really high rates. Uh, we would literally be the most valuable company in the world before like the math makes sense to like cut off your nose to like spite your face because even though we're taking balances away every single month the the amount of interest they're charging on all the remaining balances that are there it's better in their better interest to, to leave the rates high and since they can't identify who's using tally and who's not which is an important component they can't specifically um, go uh, price kind of competing against us Yes, I'd love to know um, how are you approaching communicating to your target uh, faith, you know, that they can have faith in you. What, what um, variables are you working on to create that? Yeah, that's a great question. We start with design. So uh, the sign-up process and all the experience within Tally, we actually redesigned it three separate times before we launched a year ago. Uh, and that was really painful, but we just believed that the design and the user experience had to be exceptional, so that was the first. And then the second is we have to deliver. So when you sign up for Tally within 24 hours, money already hit your cards, like you're seeing that things are happening, and we just have to make sure that we actually do the work we promise to do. Like we earn, earn the faith by actually doing the work and getting your results. I mean, we, uh, these are... Um, the, the two most interesting stats that we've seen since we launched is we have 99% monthly retention. So once a person experiences automation, like they don't want to go back to doing more work. 
So they like automation. That's the first thing. And then secondly, we've uh, saved our customers uh, millions of dollars already since we launched uh, a year ago. And so we're like, not only like they like it, but we're actually delivering real quantifiable money. So automation, automation actually works. What's nice is when you do all the work, you can guarantee and you can quantify the financial benefit you're giving people. So showing them savings and showing them that, hey, we're actually getting your results is, uh, is working. So those are, those are the two main ways. But, but how are you... Um how are you communicating to people that don't get to the site? Are you counting on the people who have signed up and experienced faith to start uh, evangelizing it? <laughs> uh, I like it. We're going religious here. Uh, we do have a lot of, uh, a lot of evangelism. I mean, we, we have, uh, because the satisfaction is so high, we have a lot of referrals. Um, but we, we have a full growth team. So our, our team was, the beginning of the year, we were like 15. Now we're almost 60. So we have a, a full growth team. We are hiring for everything. Um, we're hiring. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, we have a full growth team, uh, PR, everything. So it's like, I mean, it's a full course press at this point on, uh, on all, all fronts. Great. All right. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you.